We extend a cordial welcome to our exceptional panelists. Paul Milata, founder and managing director at Nemexis. Henning Stuke, a criminologist and former police detective. Christian Hunt, founder of Human Risk. Thomas Kastning, managing director of WBN, Whistleblower Netzwerk. And Antonia Wolle, manager and lawyer at KPMG Law. Hello everybody, uh, my name is Christian Hunt and uh, I'm going to be doing a very short presentation for you before I introduce you to our panellists and we have a discussion around whistleblowing. And the topic that I think it would be helpful for us to introduce our session in is all about the psychology of whistleblowing because whistleblowing involves human beings and if we want to have the best out of those people we need to make sure that we've understood the psychology of what's going on. So in a brief presentation I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about some of the thoughts around the psychology of whistleblowing. And I think it's helpful to start by asking a very simple question. Why do we need whistleblowers? What, what, what are we trying to achieve by encouraging them? And the answer is that when something goes wrong, it usually turns out that someone somewhere within an organization knew something that could have helped prevent it. And so we can look at whistleblowers as a form of risk management, and ideally an early warning form of risk management. And this idea that people can help us by being warning systems is, of course, something that we've seen in history. If we think back to court jesters in medieval times, they fulfilled a risk management role, saying things to the monarch that nobody else could say. And then in the Catholic Church, we have the devil's advocate there to call out potential flaws in future popes. And what's fascinating about both of these roles is that these are artificially created constructs. We know that people won't naturally speak up. And so the fact that these roles have been created tells us quite a lot about the nature of the psychology. It's not something that people would naturally do on their own. We have to create and help them to do that. And so I think it's useful to think about why people don't whistleblow. What are the impediments that prevent that from happening? Because if we want people to do something, it's a good idea to understand the reasons why they might not. And the most obvious barrier that we have is logistical. If I don't know who to speak to, I don't know how to do it, then that's a challenge for me. I need to have a mechanism by which I can do that. And so logistical barriers do exist and they're very important. And so we need to consider that in our uh, thinking about how we can encourage whistleblowing. But much more importantly, I think, than the logistical barriers are the psychological barriers. And here are just a few of the reasons why whistleblowing can be particularly tough. The first one, is a sense of tribal loyalty. We all like to belong in groups. We naturally operate in groups. We like being part of communities. And speaking up against the broader community is quite a big challenge for us. So this tribal loyalty can be very, very powerful. And particularly if that tribal loyalty happens to be to an employer who is paying us money. That can be a big challenge. It's a big drag on us to speak up. Most of us prefer to be bystanders. And the picture that you can see here is a really interesting 21st century manifestation of bystanding. This is an attempt to get people not to take photographs at accident sites. So there's a QR code there that's basically been put there. If you take a picture of the accident site, what happens, a QR code comes up, it takes you to a website that warns you that gawping at an accident site is not particularly helpful for the emergency services. And so here's an illustration in the 21st century that we prefer to bystand and watch than actually speak up. And if we're thinking about whistleblowing, I like to think about it in terms of bungee jumping. We have got to have a lot of faith that if we are going to take the risk of speaking up against the tribe and not just standing by, that we're going to be supported. And the reason that we might do a bungee jump is we know that there is some elastic that's going to catch us. And the question for whistleblowers is, can they trust that that exists in the organization? Because nobody would jump off and do a bungee jump without some form of security. And what we're asking people to do to speak up is the same thing. We're asking them to take a massive leap of faith. And so we need to make sure that if we want them to do that, that they feel secure in doing it. Because otherwise, they are effectively jumping off with no sense of security. And one of the challenges around it is that the way that I can determine what will happen as a whistleblower 
is I'll look around to see what other people have done. I will see what stories are out there. And of course, one of the challenges around whistleblowing stories is that we tend to have the big, high-profile stories, the Bradley Birkenfelds of this world. Those are the things that we look at, and we can see the impact that it's had on those people's lives. What we tend not to have are smaller stories. We tend not to talk about people that have come forward. And so if I'm somebody that's contemplating being a whistleblower, I will be looking around to say, has anybody ever done this before? And if there are no stories out there, that can be a real challenge. And so organizations really need to think, if you want to encourage people to do this, then having something I can look to, a role model, in a story that I can hear and understand, can be very, very powerful. And the psychological impact on whistleblowers mustn't be underestimated. People are under huge amounts of stress. Because of all these pressures, they're going to have to think very, very carefully. They're putting themselves in a lot of personal risk, or at least they will think they're putting themselves at a lot of personal risk. And so the psychological pressures on whistleblowers are immense. And if we don't think about that in how we structure and how we approach them, then we run the risk of putting people in a position where the alternative of not being stressed by just keeping quiet seems much more attractive than the alternative of being incredibly stressed and going through a process that has uncertainty attached to it. And this cognitive load on whistleblowers is not to be underestimated. So what are we trying to do when we want people to whistleblow? Well, we're trying to get the right people to whistleblow at the right time for the right reasons. And what do I mean by that? Well, we want the right people to whistleblow. We want people who've got information to come forward. We don't want every single employee to be whistleblowing all of the time. So we need to target this. It's a very interesting compliance challenge because many compliance objectives involve every single employee doing something or not doing something. Whistleblowing, we are trying to target a very specific subset of the population. And of course, the problem is we don't know who they are. So we've got to think very carefully about how we transmit a message that is going to get to those people that we may not be able to identify. And we want them to do it at the right time. Because whistleblowing after the event is helpful, but it's not as helpful as whistleblowing before the event. So we've got to make sure, as we're looking to build this environment, that we time it so that we get them as early as possible. We want whistleblowers to come and let us know ahead of time, rather than after the event. And we also want people to do it for the right reasons. This is a really good example of a compliance requirement or desired outcome that has a qualitative element. Because we want people to come forward for the right reasons. Now, you might say, well, it's fine if they come forward for the wrong reasons as long as they come forward. But actually, if we want whistleblowing to be perceived positively, it's got to be structured in a way that people are doing it voluntarily and coming forward for the right reasons, not for frivolous reasons, but for good reasons. And so targeting the right people at the right time for the right reasons is rather large challenge. And so in order to do that, one of the things that we have to provide is psychological safety. And Harvard professor Amy Edmondson defines that uh, as a belief that, no, that one will not be punished or humiliated for speaking up with ideas, questions, concerns, or mistakes. And what's really interesting about psychological safety is it does apply to whistleblowers, but it also applies to smaller incidents. And one of the things that we need to think about is if we want people to come forward with the big stuff, we also need to encourage them to come forward with the small stuff. Because if people don't feel comfortable coming forward with the small stuff, then there's even less chance of them coming forward with the big stuff. And so when we look at whistleblowing, one of the challenges here is that if I'm looking around and I don't have a sense that it's a sort of organization where I'm allowed to come forward with small problems, then there's even less chance of me coming forward with big ones. And if we wrap all of this together, I think we have to start thinking about the psychology behind what's driving whistleblowers. If we want it to be effective, we've got to think about the human beings at the end of it. And I'll finish with what I think is a fabulous example of how an authority has started to think about this intelligently. This is from the Transport Police in the UK. And they've started a campaign to help them identify security risks, so terrorism threats, other behaviors that you wouldn't want. And what they've recognized in this campaign of see it, say it, sorted, is that you need to combine both the logistical and the psychological issues. And what they've thought about here is very simply to say, well, the average person needs to have very clear instructions about what it is they need to do. So see it, if you see something, you should say it, and they will take care of it, they will sort it. And what's fascinating about this is they've made it incredibly simple. They've thought about it from the perspective of the person who might want to report something. 
provided a very simple slogan, a very simple set of three phrases for you to remember, a very simple way that you can text or phone in something you've seen, and a huge amount of psychological reassurance that once you've done that, the problems will be taken off your hands. And for me, if we want to start thinking about whistleblowing, we've got to be thinking in these terms. Removing some of these psychological barriers makes it much easier for people to do the things that we want them to do. With that said, let's begin our discussion, and I'll join my fellow panelists, and I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves in turn, and then we'll start and ask some questions. So, Antonia, if I could start with you. Thank you. Um, yeah, my name is Antonia Vole, and I'm a lawyer at KPMG Law. Um, one field of my expertise is advising on the implementation of whistleblowing systems and also on the regular operations. And um, I would say I'm a compliance enthusiastic and enthusiastic about whistleblowing and the whole topic. And I look forward to speak with my fellow panelists. Thomas. Thank you for the introduction. Um, my name is Thomas Thomas Kastnenk. Um, I manage a small Berlin-based NGO called Whistleblower Network. Um, we receive requests from individual whistleblowers who we guide through the process. Um, we have um, close contact with politics and uh, the government, i.e., for example, um, the directive uh, within the last one and a half years, but also, for example, f um, with a supply chain law um, within the last year. And third but not uh, least, um, like all of us, we receive more and more requests for um, help with implementing systems from companies, but also from NGOs, for example. Paul? Yes, uh, thank you. My name is Paul Milata. I'm a fraud investigator by accident. I was an uh, international consultant uh, more than a decade ago, stumbled into a very large fraud case. Um, and since that time, um, I'm absolutely convinced that anti-corruption is uh, the most um, useful and the most relevant thing I can do. And uh, this is why um, I set up a uh, small consulting company specializing on uh, uh, cases uh, starting or involving Central and Eastern Europe. We're usually um, involved in investigations uh, of what's called serious fraud cases. Um, but I am also um, because of that, I'm a very uh, a big supporter of uh, the whistleblower protection legislation and uh, measures which are going to uh, be implemented, hopefully, uh, with uh, the end of this year. And last but by no means least, Henning. Thanks. <clears throat> yeah, my name is Henning Stuke. I'm a criminologist and I'm delivering trainings for investigative interviewing scenarios. And I'm also delivering trainings for responders for people, employees, being in contact, being in interaction with the whistleblower. This is a very, let's say, underestimated knowledge in the field of all corporates. Probably I can share some insights later. And, thank you. And thank you very much and welcome, everybody. Um, obviously, we have our panelists here very keen to get your questions as well, so please feel free to submit those and we'll tackle as many of those as, as we can. And while we wait for those to come in, um, perhaps Henning, if we could potentially start with you, because I talked a lot about the, the, the psychology of what whistleblowers go through. But you have been looking very much at how the respondents behave and, and how they think about things. Can you talk to us a little bit about how that works and why that's important? I will try, Kristen. Thanks. So this is a blind spot in lots of companies. How to interact, how to communicate with the whistleblower. For example, if you have got a tool, this is good. But to have a, if you have a channel, this is good. Even if a tool is better. But at the end of the day, it's all about people's business. And at the end of the day, it's about getting someone to say yes. And you need to convince a whistleblower that he collaborate to your investigation because he's the most important person at this stage of the investigation. He can probably make an undisclosed statement. He can make an undisclosed, convince his colleagues to, to contribute to the situation, to, to finger point to the fishy documents and so on. So at the end of the day, he's the very most important person in that case. And so that's why we need to create a strong bond to this whistleblower because the investigation become faster and even cheaper the stronger the bond is created to the whistleblower. And there's a systematic approach <coughs> to reach out to the, system, um, to the whistleblower. Because it is not certain, even if the whistleblower has submitted his concern, has submitted his incident, it is not certain that the whistleblower would not withdraw this because there's a small time window and these we need to, to identify and we need to react on that. And there's a 
approach, a systematic approach to do so. This is the, called the behavioral change stairway model. The behavioral change stairway model is a, is a concept. This was invented by the FBI roughly 20 years ago in case of hostage taking um, negotiation scenarios. And to convince somebody to commit, to contribute to a mutual goal. And this comprises five stairs and you have to walk through each stair before making any influence attempt. And this is a very conceptualized approach to have someone from psychological perspective um, convinced to contribute to your investigation. The first one, for example, is active listening. I know that the most cases we receive in a written format, like a mail, email, or whatever, inserted in the tool. So it's more active reading. Before coming to the step again, I would highlight the second step, empathy. Empathy, I'm not talking about compassion. This is not the case. We're talking about cognitive empathy, meaning the intellectual ability, the intellectual challenge to creep into someone else's skin and to see the world through his eyes. But to understand what is the concern of the whistleblower, before I'm going back to step one, I have to make a text analysis. I have to deeply dive into the text to understand what is the concern of the whistleblower. And there's a tool, this tool is called sequence analysis. The sequence analysis was founded in the 70 years by Ulrich Oevermann. This is a scientific tool to identify further information out of one text. It is a very complicated one, but if you use this, uh, criminologists lose this, for example, for analysis of blackmail letters or the hostage letters, a kidnapping letters. Um, <clears throat> to better understand the fear and the concern of the whistleblower. Lots of responders might think or may think that the most fear of whistleblowers is retaliation, punishment, sanctioning. But in the most cases, this is not the fact. Research has been found that the most fear of whistleblowers is getting being, being viewed negatively, labeled negatively from their peers. So this is very important that you as a responder understand what the whistleblower's concern is. Otherwise, he could probably fail, not treat him fairly, appropriate, whatever. And he could, let's say, probably dis, um, decide or regret <coughs> to have made this, um, this incident. So and also, it is very important that the responders has some knowledge about some social psychological effects, for example, the mum effect. The mum effect was, <coughs> was investigated roughly 50 years ago by Tessa and Rosen. And they found out that people are more willing to share good news with each other, among each other, than bad news, because they know that bad news might probably affect the well-being of the recipient. And this leads to, from my perspective, to two very interesting implications. The first one, within an organization. We all of us, we are affected by the mum effect. <clears throat> this leads to the situation that within a company, bottom-up, predominantly positive news are conveyed to the top management. And the top management is doing his decision based predominantly on the positive news. But on the other side, they should do it on the basis of negative news for better steering their business. And from my perspective, a good compliance training is not only linked to presentation and coffee cups with compliance and pencils with compliance. This is also linked to enable to make trainings for the department managers, for the employees, to sensitize those for the <clears throat> mum effect, for example. We want to have each and every bad news, we want to have this transported up. The second step regarding the mum effect in this conjunction is <clears throat> the responder should also be aware of this mum effect. Mums means <clears throat> keep quiet, be silent. The responder should be explicit, explicitly encourage the whistleblower <clears throat> to convey bad news. Like in example, the more bad news you are willing to share, the happier am I. And so we can go through those steps. At the end of the day, there are some points, probably we can later back to this topic, um, how I can influence a whistleblower to create a stronger bond that the investigation comes straight forward. Fascinating. And we'll keep moving through our guests and, and, and getting some views and perspectives from them on their, their areas of expertise. Of course, we do want your questions, so please feel free to submit those and we'll take those later in the session. Paul, moving, moving to you, you've been looking at the data behind whistleblowing and sort of uh, what, what does it tell us about people and their, their motivations and, and what's happening? Yes, exactly. Um, 
I, uh, I started to look at the uh, data regarding whistleblowers because um, when the uh, discussion regarding whistleblower protection in Germany started, it was, um, um, it was immediately followed by a number of myths which were quite um, popular, they still are, and I just wanted to know what, uh, what the actual situation is. I'm, I'm a CFE, I'm a member of the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners. We have a very, very um, clear opinion with regard to whistleblowers. They are by far the most important um, source for detecting uh, fraud. In our definition, fraud means corruption, asset misappropriation, and financial statement fraud. Uh, whistleblowers alone identify 40 to 50 percent of these cases and all the other tools we know are responsible for detecting the other 50 percent. So um, whistleblowers usually um, are convinced that the information they convey is relevant and they're right. I mean just uh, the fact that half of all fraud cases are identified via whistleblowers uh, proves them right. Now um, it is of course uh, true that not all people coming with a tip are coming with a substantiated tip, uh, just half of them are. But um, one of the myths I was, I was uh, particularly intrigued of was uh, this idea that whistleblowers are somehow um, informants or to uh, put it more bl bluntly, rats, or uh, to use the German word, uh, denunzianten. Um, there is um, no, there is no data supporting that. Um, it's quite clear that um, whistleblowers are uh, attempting to, uh, to uh, uh, convey a message uh, in order to actually solve to, uh, a situation in their company. 77% uh, of whistleblowers don't talk to an external party, they talk to an internal employee, they talk to management, a colleague, a direct supervisor. For most of them, uh, what's later called the, f the TIP, the whistleblowing act, is actually their job. If you look at Pav Gill and the situation in Singapore with Wirecard, uh, Pav was just doing his job. He was a compliance lawyer in Singapore. He was tasked with doing what he was doing. And at the end of the day, um, he was afraid that he will be killed. So um, there, there is no evidence out there that the whistleblowers are um, interested in harming their companies. What is true, and this is something you have, um, you have mentioned using the concepts of, of behavioral psychology, tribal loyalty, fear, those are really, uh, those are concepts which can be seen in the numbers. Um, globally speaking, out of 1,000 full-time employees in a company, you can expect, with every 1,000 full-time employees, you can expect to have to receive 15 tips per year. Now, that's the global benchmark. Europe is at five. Of all the continents worldwide, of all the, f f uh, the regions worldwide, Europe has, uh, by far, the lowest number of, of tips per 1,000 FTEs. Uh, whistleblowers expect that there will be retaliation against them. They're absolutely right to think that. They should be afraid because there will be retaliation. Um, studies such as you know, the very well-known uh, article in the New England Journal of Medicine published in 2010 and using just a rather small sample uh, is, is, is clearly showing the type of stress and uh, suicidal thoughts, uh, divorce cases, things like that, which have become part and parcel of many, many whistleblower cases. And this is something which has to be addressed. Um, this is something which has to change. Um, I am also um, very, uh, I'm, I'm fascinated by, by uh, the, uh, by the, uh, the, uh, the decision taken by a whistleblower, when they start, when they think, you know, who am I going to address now? I mentioned that they're addressing, 77% are addressing, a, 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 you know, somebody in the company. Now, it's not those people you might expect. They do not talk, for example, to an in-house lawyer. 
because they don't think that this is a legal problem affecting them. They think that they're talking about an operational issue, whatever that is. They don't think about talking to HR. Only three to five percent are addressing HR. So um, most of them think that they're actually doing their job. And what cannot be hidden, however, is the fact that, again, out of 1,000 employees, uh, you can expect to receive only 15 tips per year. And uh, this, is, this is a major, major um, factor, uh, proving that, yes, tribal loyalty, fear, the, uh, the wish to be respected by your peers, but also issues like, you know, having a mortgage, thinking about your kids, is really stopping most people to, uh, to come out. So these are the numbers, if you want, behind the uh, topics we're discussing today. Fascinating. And I think that, that takes us nicely, Thomas, into, into your space around the sort of the practical experiences. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what you have seen in your, in your work with the, the practicalities of this. Um, well, from a practical perspective, I believe that the most important word has been dropped a couple or a number of times. Um, that is probably trust. Um, around this building of trust with people who are in a very difficult situation, in a very uh, stressed situation. Um, and trust sounds so simple, but in this situation it is um, very difficult. I believe that the people who call us are quite often in a more, even more difficult situation than, for example, if they go to their compliance officer within their company. Um, that is something that makes my work sometimes a bit difficult, that all of this is called whistleblowing. Um, you mentioned Puff Jill, um, then we've seen Facebook a couple of days ago. Um, if, if I talk to my friends and I say whistleblowing, they say, oh, Edward Snowden. Um, but then in the end, when we talk about cases within this round, we don't mean these cases, we mean things that stay within the organization. Um, and I believe sometimes it would be better for the discourse if we would have two words for that. Um, uh, because building trust in that case might be a bit different to um, in the other case, but uh, in, in all cases, this process of building trust, um, I believe, has a couple of things. And one thing is that you have to take the concerns of the whistleblower series. We had that. Um, the whistleblowers want to go against some form of wrongdoing, so if you take that part serious, you're already one step further. Um, then we had um, that the whistleblower has certain concerns like um, being um, mobbed or losing the job, retaliation. Um, if you take that serious, uh, you are even one step further. Um, then we had the um, channels you communicate through that has to do something with trust as well. Um, and of course, from a perspective from the company, for example, the question how to set up that process with the communication channels also has to do something with um, how cheap is it, how expensive is it. Um, let's not neglect that, but um, if you say trust is the main thing, try to offer a wide variety there, that is sometimes something we experience as well, that um, for some whistleblowers, like the online way, the way to go for others, it's the phone. And then you need time, that's what you said, right? At the beginning, you need time to listen and build that trust. Um, so I think that is from a practical perspective that. Um, w one, one thought I just had is uh, you talked about this tribe loyalty on the one hand, and then you talked about the conflict of loyalty. Um, what I always find interesting to ask myself is where, where does the other part of the lo loyalty go? Is it loyalty to the higher values of the company? Is it a loyalty to the higher values of a society? Um, or is it the loyalty to the law at that point? And if you manage to dissolve that conflict, I think you are already f one step further. Fabulous. And as ever, we want your questions, so please do feel free to submit those and we'll, we'll, we'll tackle those. Brings us on, Antonia, talk to us a little bit around the, the, the legal constructs here, because obviously this is something that we've, we've talked about legislation coming in. There's a lot of focus on that. How is that being looked at and, and you know, what's, what, what's sort of the, the thinking there? So um, I think the good thing, the good news are um, all psychological aspects that my fellow panelists already mentioned have been uh, in mind when lawmakers made um, 
laws regarding whistleblowing or laws regarding whistleblower protection. Um, of course, generally speaking, lawmakers have in mind the welfare of society, um, and their aim is, of course, to um, uh, detect uh, any incidents and misbehavior and then to sort of prevent that in future. And um, if you speak about the EU whistleblowing directive or other national laws, the transposition of the directive in national laws, or you speak about um, the new Lieferketten Gesetz, the supply chain law coming up in Germany, and also um, our anti money laundering law, all these um, laws actually. Uh, take into account psychological aspects of whistleblowing and they because they want to encourage whistleblowing in the end um, um, and so um, yeah the, the, the focus of um, lawmakers is to encourage uh, whistleblowing um, and in the EU directive for example you have certain aspects um, in mind how, how they want to go about encouraging whistleblowers um, so, first of all, I think the, the biggest point is the um, point that they actually statute the protection of whistleblowers by law. Um, so that's one big step ahead. And then you also have the concept of um, anonymity, um, of confidential, confidentiality. You have um, the wide scope of the directive. So um, all aspects that um, take into account that whistleblower needs to be encouraged, needs to be protected. Um, and needs to yeah, uh, be, be able to um, make a report. Um, so the same goes for the other um, laws I mentioned where um, you have uh, also recommendations to how to um, implement the, the protection and the anonymity and the confidentiality um, towards um, I was oh, uh, one important aspect in that regard is also um, how the differentiation between the reporting channels that you have. So, um, uh, especially in the EU directive, it encourages um, the whistleblower to um, it, to go via the internal reporting channel. This is something that, um, from my perspective, is a good um, step for um, entities actually to to encourage employees to go this um, via the internal reporting channel. Of course, um, with both can also choose the external channel, but um, from a psychological aspect, as we heard before, um, it is more likely that with both will actually re report internally. So it is important um, that these channels are actually set up in a way that is um, confidential, that is convenient for the whistleblower. Um, and that brings me to another part that actually um, is at the moment um, in an ongoing discussion regarding the problem if a group of um, entities um, can share one reporting channel. So um, the standpoint of the commission in that regard is that it's not possible that every entity with more than 50 employees has to have their own reporting channel. Um, and all the arguments the commission brings in that regard actually go just um, directly to the whistleblower's well-being, the whistleblower being safe. So um, they state that um, the proximity of the whistleblower to his employ employer, um, that the um, possibility to request a physical meeting with someone you know, all, this kind of, um, all these thoughts go in the way that a um, whistleblower needs to psychologically be able and feel safe and protected in that regard. And fascinating, and as ever, do submit your questions. We're very keen to, to, to hear from you. Um, but I'm, I'm struck as you were all talking that, that in many respects it's very simple. We're just asking people to report things that they have seen. And yet all of you talked around complexity, and that might be complexity through the, the legal requirements of it, the psychological requirements, the practicalities of it. And it really strikes me that this is a challenge. And, I, and, and, and Thomas, I wanted to pick up your point around the, the, the name for it. Because I think one of the challenges we see, as you pointed out, whistleblowing is that big thing, the big, the big names that call out the big issues. But of course, that's not the majority of cases. Can you talk a little bit more around how, you know, how, how can we think about this and how can we make it less of a big deal? Because it seems to me the big obstacle here is it's a big thing and you feel like you're unleashing a whole load of processes. How can we think about that? Well, I mean, you already mentioned at the beginning that it would be great to have 
um, faces and stories behind it. And I thought while you were talking that it's a great idea to find people and um, to give uh, a face and a story to like those more simple things and um, to spread the word that there are a lot of organizations around where such a speak up culture works and um, there is no retaliation afterwards and you can go back to your community and things go on. Um, that would be great, but uh, then on the other hand, you, you find those negative examples, and um, maybe those are a bit too much discussed in there. <laughs> uh, Christian, there, there are some terms uh, in use because many people who are being called whistleblowers don't like the term themselves. And uh, for example, in, uh, in North America, there are, uh, it's quite, the, the term report is quite widespread. So the whistleblower is a reporter mm -hmm. of something. Mm -hmm. And um, there are also some discussions which I find very, very interesting, drawing um, not at least a legal parallel between a whistleblower and a witness. And it is not that wrong to call a whistleblower a witness in certain situations. Um, and then to ask the question, if you are protecting a witness who's just uh, seen a crime on the street, why don't you, pub why don't you protect a witness who has seen a hundred crimes in an office, and this is uh, these are some terms which I, I have encountered, uh, but I can mm. confirm that the term whistleblower is a problem in itself for many people, not the least the whistleblowers themselves. And Henning, you you, you gave us some really interesting <coughs> insights into the you know the, the challenges here, and and again it's a simple process, and so we just want people to come forward, but the way the organisation responds. You know, will have a significant impact on that. How can we start to get to grips with that? Because as we want to encourage more people to come forward, we need to be thinking about these issues. And yet, what you, you've rightly pointed out, there's lots of traps here. Is this something where we need organizations to be thinking and having very formal structures around this? Or is this perhaps we, do we equip lots of employees with the skills to be able to handle this? How can we, how can we think about translating some of those complex challenges that you talked about into, into reality for people? Yeah, I do think that good communication is, is focused on psychological topics and employees should be aware of those direct psychological topics. For example, there's, you mentioned it already, the bystander effect. It was investigated by Bip Laten and John Daly in the early 60s or early 70s, also known as Kitty DeGeneres syndrome. Kitty Genuise was a lady, she was killed in the end of 60s in New York. Mm. The offense lasted roughly 30 minutes and 38 people have seen, were watching those events and these events, these offense, and no one of them called the police. Mm. Because why? And then later, Vip Laten and John Dowley investigated this scenario and did a lot of experiments and found out that it's not linked between this scenario between the victim and the bystander. It is linked to the situation, the bystander themselves, among them each other. They called it diffusion of responsibility. And they found out at the end of the day, they found out the longer any misconduct lasts and the more people are aware of this, the less likely this situation, this misconduct is going to be reported. This is also an effect each responder should be aware of. In example, you receive a message about an ongoing fraud lasting six, six months, for example. And this could have an impact on your evaluation as a responder on the judgment of this case. So each responder should also be aware of this. Probably he needs to understand why this topic was not reported previously. And this has an impact on the judgments, on the credibility, probably on the whistleblower. And so there are a lot of effects, not only employees, especially responders should be aware of. And, and Tony, you, you talked a lot about the, 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 the sort of legislative approach to this, mm -hmm. and clearly there's a sense from the authorities that, that we need to impose some, we, you know, this isn't happening naturally, mm -hmm. so we're going we're to legislate to make it happen. And of course that comes with a whole need to document, demonstrate, and almost build some bureaucracy around it to demonstrate you're doing mm -hmm. the right thing. I wonder what, uh, and open to any, anyone, the, the sort of thinking around that, the more bureaucratic we make this, the yeah. further we risk getting away from the human elements of it. And if I feel, you know, back to whistleblowing, it feels like a big issue. The word conjures up all sorts of images. The more challenging we make it, the more we build infrastructure around it, potentially that could have an impact on people's willingness to come forward. And I wonder mm. what people thought around that. Mm. Well, I totally agree. Of course, um, from my perspective, or you have to 
um, yeah, take on the challenges or like fulfill the requirements of the law that are given around the documenting and reporting systems and that kind of thing. But um, yeah, as I said, the more um, bureaucratic you make something and the less easy it is for someone to step forward and to approach people, of course, probably they won't do it because it's too hard to match. So yeah, I agree. It, that's a very good point. It's a very relevant point. Um, and I think that the example uh, you can have in front of your eyes is having the exact same policy, let's call it the anti-fraud policy, in two different companies. Uh, one company has an anti-fraud policy of five pages. This is actually a format recommended by the ACFE. It's, it works. It has been implemented in hundreds of companies. Mm -hmm. And then you have an anti-fraud policy in the second company, which has 120 pages. People have to sign both. Which one do you think is going to be remembered? <laughs> of course, the short one. However, there has been a, um, uh, an explosion um, of compliance services in the last 10, 15 years in Germany without having the whistleblower protection. So the most important element of the entire whistleblower world is missing. And this led to the uh, creation of a fake solution, which is the, uh, the bureaucratic uh, tools, which are missing something. They're missing their core. They're missing the source. And this is really something which has to be thought about, because while we are starting to uh, talk about the transposition of the whistleblower uh, directive into national law, we see how particular national governments have started to, no, have identified the weak spots in the directive and have come up with very creative uh, solutions how to implement the directive pretend to protect the whistleblowers, but at the same time create a honey trap. And it's a bureaucratic one, always. So I find that point to be excellent, yeah. And what were you thinking about that? Like if, if you say countries c came up with, with such ideas? Um, for example, um, in the Czech Republic, uh, there is going to be a office for the whistleblower where people are gonna go as whistleblowers thinking that they're going to be helped. In fact, that office is going to tell them, um, it works like a tourism information office. It's going to tell them where to go mm -hmm. in order to mm -hmm. uh, you know, publish their, mm -hmm. their tip. Another situation is over here in Germany. The fact that the, uh, uh, there is a huge opposition in the German government to uh, have the whistleblower directive applied not only to uh, areas of EU law, but to all areas of the law. And if we don't have the second solution, if we don't have this application to the national law, we are going to create an, a, a bureaucratic monster. And we're going to create a, a trap for whistleblowers because, for example, they are going to think that they are protected by the whistleblower directive mm -hmm. because they have a tip with regard to, let's say, um, public health. But in fact, their tip is redefined as being uh, related to a healthcare provider, which is not part of the whistleblower protection directive. Mm -hmm. So these are the types of, of, of administrative uh, issues which can actually kill the whistleblower protection uh, in effect if it's not implemented properly. I hope your words are heard. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to hear that it's not only the NGOs speaking out that directly. Oh, um, no. Yeah. <laughs> you and got our we, support. We, we, we've had a question in from Yvonne Hilst, and, and, and thank you for your, your question. And she asks, should whistleblowing be a job requirement by policy or contract? And should failure to raise misconduct be grounds for discipline up to and including termination? So should we just make this mandatory, get people to do this because it's in their employment contracts and therefore focus on it? What, what do we think about that? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, right now, what do we have in the employment contracts? We have the confidentiality clause. In every single German labor contract, there is the confidentiality clause. It's the exact opposite. Henning, if I fully agree. I fully agree to Paul. This is what we need. This is the approach People, people should react on this exactly, yeah. Yes, but it's really hard to define yeah. where is the line, isn't it? Like, what do you have to report and what you don't have to report? You don't want to create an environment where 
you have to report the theft of a pen or whatever, like this mm. bad example. But if you could elaborate on that, how to draw it. <laughs> <laughs> but this is, uh, I disagree a bit. Mm. I also would like to get a theft communicated. Mm -hmm. Because I also would like yeah. that this channel is also used for improvements. Dear mm -hmm. boss, could we do it like this or like that way? Mm -hmm. So I would, I would my, by myself, I would put it in the right range to have everything reported, which could be optimized. Uh, on the other hand, isn't it something that is, oh, it's, I don't know, not as productive if, if someone is forced to do it? I don't... I'm not sure if you have like this clause in your contract that you're actually then more willing to report just because you're forced to do it. I think it's a good thing, don't get me wrong, but just will it actually change so much and how will you detect it? What will you do if someone doesn't do it? And you know what I mean? Um, maybe I was not very precise. I think that it would be revolutionary to delete the confidentiality yeah. clause from the labor contracts. Yeah. And if you look at the job specification of a CEO, CFO, whatever, these tasks, the ones we would wish them to do, are usually already in their contract. Mm -hmm. They are obliged to look after the well-being of the employees. They are obliged to look uh, after the well-being of uh, particular clients, suppliers, and of course the wealth to protect the wealth of the company. So this is not something they are, this is not new to, uh, to uh, existing legislation. What is new is that the confidentiality clause should be removed. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that's a very interesting point. If we look at non-disclosure agreements and yeah. think of things like sort of Harvey Weinstein, where wrongdoing was not publicized because people were subject to those, that is an interesting uh, constraint. And, and so potentially just leveling that playing field from a psychological perspective, I think is, is, is quite an interesting idea. I mean, Thomas, do you think, is, 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 have you got a, a sense here when people come to talk to you around them weighing some of these things up and, and, and the fears and the, and the motivations. How do, how do people that come to you think about that? Is that a topic? Sorry, I didn't get the question. If, the motivations if, of? In, in, in a, if, if somebody comes forward to, yeah. to, to, to speak, are they, are they thinking around it? Is, is this fear of confidentiality and potential breach of employment contract? Is that a big issue? I mean, it seems psychologically that it ought to be, but I wonder in practical terms. Um, y yes, it is. Um, Though the people who call us are quite often more in a in a stage where they wonder, um, is it the right thing to do? What could happen to me? Mm -hmm. um, is it really worth it? Um, how could I get support from a lawyer? Um, question like that. But that is always linked to to those confidential confidentiality questions. Yes, but in my opinion, or in my experience. Um, the question of what happens to my direct environment, what does it mean for my family, for example, weighs more. And one of the things that's, that, that's come up, and, and Bradley mentioned it earlier in his, in his presentation, is, is around the idea of rewarding whistleblowers. Mm. So giving people, so on the one hand, you could say it's, it's bribing them to come forward. On the other hand, you could say, well, actually, given the risks involved, we need to give people some form of security blanket. So if I, if I am fearful of losing my job, I have an opportunity to know that I'm going to be financially secure as a result and can therefore take. So what do we think about that as, as an idea? Is that, is that potentially uh, helpful or is that something that we think would, would, would hinder the, sort of the, 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 you know, the motivation of people? Hmm. Um, me personally, I'm not um, such a okay. big fan of that, to be honest. <laughs> Um, but I can understand that you can discuss it. Um, I believe more in a concept that um, if you are a whistleblower, you definitely shouldn't have any disadvantages, but your motivation shouldn't be money-driven at that point, I believe. Um, but the question how to um, stop to have like the disadvantages is not easy to answer. Um, I know there's an idea around that also my NGO somehow supports, and is discussed within the Green Party is um, to create a fund, for example, that would help people who are in a situation where they may be lost their job or also need psychological help or social help. Um, so that is something which is, for me, a bit easier to support. Yeah, the research of that part is not clear yet, mm. if it's good to incentivize mm. or not to do. 
So probably we will see what the outcome will be. Also inter interesting is, mm. from my perspective, <coughs> if we should on the motivation of the whistleblower, should it make a difference if he, his motivation is altruistically driven or is it egoistically driven? And a lot of people make their big difference and they say, no, we only want to follow those which are altruistically driven. And I would say, no, we don't should care if it's personalized motivation or is it altruistically. Yeah. At the end of the day, we should only rely on the information we received, whether they are valid or not. I completely share that, just to make that clear. Um, uh, we were really glad that the directive doesn't make any, any line between the motivational aspects. Yeah. But, yeah. I mean, uh, introducing rewards, I think, is going to create a few problems. But on the other side, why is it that so many whistleblowers who have been right with regard to small, medium and large cases are still unemployed? Why is it that whistleblowers who brought down this or that company, which was clearly a huge fraud, with people dying at a certain end, why is it that they're not hired? This is, this is, this is the reason why I think that the rewards are coming back again and again and again, because um, these people have done something which has been clearly positive to society, but they have destroyed their life while doing so, and I think that's unfair. And one of the things that it strikes me that particularly when we look at the legislative attempt to make this happen is that you, you get into the realms of codifying things and we've already talked mm. about, well, how would you draft this? Is there any sense that legislators are viewing this as an experiment or do they think this issue is solved? Because I, I, you know, we, it's a classic kind of compliance or regulatory problem, which is we see an issue, we will legislate to make sure this, in some cases, never happens again in the case of whistleblowing, more of it's happening. And yet it's very, very difficult, as we've identified, to codify this thing. Is, is there a sense from, from sort of legislative moves that they understand the complexities here and this is going to be an evolving process, or is this very much a, we'll introduce this and job done? I think that they understand that is an evolving process. But you're referring to the reward um, system now, or the or general or codifying? The, the, I think the general construct yeah, of, well, of sort of how we look at this. Of course, legislative processes are always very... Um, I don't know, restricted. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it, it, I, of course it is seen as an evolving process and um, legislation is um, you know, going back and forth, discussion, um, all that kind of things. But yeah, in the end, as, as, long, as soon as it, a, a law is in force and in place, then it's codified and um, yeah, that's, uh, the law itself will not obviously not be changed in the end, but, yeah. yeah and so it might be better not to have a very bad law too quickly, but to work yeah, two months longer definitely. and then have a better law. Yeah. But then on the other hand, you also can put something in there, like a review process after two years, which is not uncommon nowadays within laws. That might be a good idea. However, I would have wished that much more of the past experience of other countries would have flown into the existing directive and to the existing national laws. Because, for example, the United Kingdom introduced PIDA, in 1998, mm -hmm. which has at the core the same idea as the directive. It's, it's, it's based in labor law mm -hmm. and the employment tribu tribunals, and it doesn't work. The United Kingdom is now trying to reform PETA because the labor law uh, core of that, of that particular piece of legislation is actually uh, a problem. Uh, so I, I hope that, yes, it's nice to discuss things, but mm -hmm. we also need results. And I think that the, uh, uh, the international comparison of what's working and what's not should have influenced the European directive and some national laws a little bit more. And we're almost out of time, so I want to just make sure we get some final thoughts. So from each of you, can you just to, to, to help the audience as they grapple with this issue, many of them will have responsibility for managing or at least overseeing the, the, the whistleblower program. What are, what are your sort of top tips for they should think about Henning? Perhaps we can start with you. The top tips for the whistleblowers. For, the, for, the, for, <laughs> for people who are grappling with this problem. So, so the audience here who have responsibility either for running the whistleblowing program or for ensuring that it is, so from a compliance perspective, ensuring it exists. How can they start to think about this, this, this challenge? Yeah, there must be a speak up culture within the company top down and this must be enforced. And this, the top management from a company must stand absolutely behind 
the whistleblower protection. I agree, the tone from the top, the mood in the middle, but at the same time, think that you might become a whistleblower one day and think that the case involving you is a serious one, a large one, what would you wish to have in that situation? And if you have a chance to somehow, somehow influence the procedures in your company, please do. Yeah, and um, talk to the people who might be potential whistleblowers. I think that is a good way as well. Um, ask what might be the concerns and what might be their strategic goals and then align the whistleblowing management system along that. Yeah, I agree. Turn from the top. Speak to the people, listen to the people, more importantly, and uh, try to take as good care as you can, and then you will hopefully get the results that they trust you and speak to you. And, I mean, it strikes me this is, this is a really good example of where we need to be thinking about the humans at the end of the process. Because we can theoretically say this is what we would like to have happen. But actually what's happening here, as we've been highlighting, is individuals are coming forward and they are going to speak to other individuals, to Henning's earlier point. And so we need to put ourselves in, in that position for them to be able to understand. So putting yourself in the shoes of the people going through the process seems to me to be a very powerful way to conclude this. So I think with that, I'd like to say huge thanks to our panel for their contributions and, and support and effort. Uh, hopefully that was useful to you. Thank you so much for watching this session. Thank you very much to Christian, Antonia, Thomas, Powell and Henning. Fantastic to have you all here in the studio.